Love Prairie Sportsman? Become a member of Pioneer PBS today. The mine pits specifically are just phenomenal because they're incredibly clear in comparison with normal lakes. Uh, there's a lot of fish life that are interesting to see. You can actually see them. In a normal lake, you might see a puff of silt where a fish was. Barbecued crickets. Oh, yeah, that's delicious. Comes with instructions for the assembly, but also a, a pre-designed layout. Funding for this program was provided by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await and the members of Pioneer PBS. When Minnesota's weather turns cold and hostile, scuba divers flock to the warmer waters of the Caribbean and Pacific Islands. But this year, international travel is being replaced by road trips, and many people are discovering the thrill of deep water dives in northern Minnesota's abandoned mine pits. Mine pits specifically are just phenomenal because they're incredibly clear in comparison with normal lakes. Uh, there's a lot of fish life that are interesting to see. You can actually see them. In a normal lake, you might see a puff of silt where a fish was because they'll sense you coming and they'll take off. And there's a lot of um, foundations of buildings and mine shafts and cars and trucks and uh, railroad rails and uh, all sorts of things that were left over from the mining days too. So it's quite interesting. A lot of really cool walls that you can dive on. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's a popular spot out there. Minnesota School of Diving owner Todd Matthews and other experienced divers lead fun dives in mine pits from May through October. We've got a lot of the same people. A lot of the same people have been diving with us for 30 years, 20 years. Um, they've really become family, but then there's a lot of people that are coming up for the first time, making that transition from their training to actually getting out there and just uh, enjoying themselves. So. We've got these, these mines, both the, the Cuyuna Range, which has the Cuyuna State Rec area. There's also a series of mines up uh, in the Virginia area, up there, Gilbert and that, the Masabi Range. Some of those are now opening up for diving too. There's a place called Orbigon in Gilbert. It encouraged divers to actually plant items down there. I think there's a helicopter in there, there's a school bus. People like to put skeletons down there, the little plastic skeletons. Uh, so there's one hanging from a tree in one of the mines with a, a plastic skeleton of a vulture kind of hanging over the shoulder. Uh, there's another one, there's a bartender behind a, a bar, a pirate bartender, whatever, that's serving up drinks in one of the mines. Uh, there's another pirate in a sailboat, so th the skeletons have become quite popular for people to do that and just put them in different positions. At least once a summer, Todd leads a Great Lakes shipwreck tour. Decades ago, divers stopped bringing up artifacts from these wrecks so that they could remain intact for others to enjoy. The shipwrecks there are phenomenal too because that's all freshwater. Uh, the freshwater preserves the wrecks very well. There's a, there's a few wrecks up there that are actually wooden that sank over 100 years ago that are still in you know, pristine, pretty much pristine condition. There's still paint on the side of their hulls. Every few years, Todd will also organize a diving trip to the international destinations such as Chuuk Lagoon in the West Pacific, where Americans bombed a large Japanese naval base during World War II. We hear that it is a complex of heavily fortified I think islands. 65 Japanese ships were sunk there, and um, you can go dive on those. Uh, so, and some of the wrecks are still army tanks strapped to the deck of the wrecks. There's airplanes, complete airplanes inside, like Japanese Zero fighter planes are in there. 
There's all sorts of live, live ordnance, like big 16-inch, 18-inch shells for the Yamato and Musashi uh, battleships. So there's all these things are still in these wrecks. So. Todd owns two facilities. The newest is in St. Cloud, and the original dive school is in Brainerd, where his father started the business in 1959. The schools offer different levels of training and certifications, ranging from Discover Scuba, for those who just want to try it out, to the full PADI Open Water Diver Certification course. Learning to dive in cold water has its advantages because if you know you can dive in cold water with all the gear that's required, you can do it in warm water, it's much easier. And then just work on your diving. Don't, don't try to add a bunch of stuff, like don't try carrying a camera right away. Just, just work on becoming comfortable diving and, and get that down. For a lot of people, once they get certified in the cold water and then experience a warm water trip, they never go back in the cold water but I actually liked it. Because water temperatures drop from the 50s to the 30s when you're at 60 feet, Curtis switched from a wetsuit to a dry suit. Wetsuits allow a thin layer of water inside the suit, whereas a dry suit offers protection from cold water with neck and wrist seals, glued on boots, and insulated clothes underneath. And that just changes your whole perspective on diving because now you have a perpetual dive season. You can dive all through winter if you want, cut a hole in the ice, jump in and go. The Great Lakes became a possibility. They never warm up. You're always in cold, near freezing water. So sort of doing shipwrecks and um, sort of exploring some of the deeper pits here in Cuyuna and saw some stuff that you can't see unless you're willing to go deeper. To see the Friday the 13th Jason Voorhees, made by Curtis's friend Doug, requires diving down 115 feet to the bottom of the Louise pit. And we've had a lot of people inquiring about, I want to get to Jason Voorhees. Well, we have to be pretty concerned about what their experience level is because it's not an easy dive going to 115, so. Some stuff is plunged into the water to cover up a crime, like guns and cars. Uh, myself and most of my staff are members of the Crowley County Dive Rescue Squad, so when we see any new vehicle that's in there, obviously we're concerned about the oil, the gasoline, any kind of contamination. We report it, try to get a VIN number, serial or a, a license plate number to report it, and usually those items are pulled out. A volunteer dive squad's mission can be heartbreaking when the search is for a drowning victim. What motivates us as divers for that squad is uh, trying to understand or uh, empathize with the, the, the members of the family of, of the lost victim. You can't imagine anything probably more horrific than having to spend a night with your loved ones still in the water. So we'll do everything we possibly can to try to find them as quickly as possible. Most diving excursions bring peace and relaxation. Diving really isn't a thrill-seeking thing. I think more people get injured bowling than they do diving. Most people just want it as an escape to swim around, enjoy themselves, and, and look at stuff. And, you know, have the camaraderie of our groups that we've got to go on. The upfront costs can be a little shocking to some people. And I think for the classes, and if you want a full set of gear, it's probably going to cost you about $2,000. But after that, it's pretty cheap if you, if you dive local. It's $4 for a, for a fill in your tank and you can go out and dive. If I'm near water, I always want to jump in and see what's in there. You know, what am I missing out on by staying on shore? I carry my camera every dive. I don't turn it on and shoot every dive, but it's definitely with me every time I get in the water. The first time Curtis attempted to film his friend Doug catching fish underwater, a bass hammered the lure right in front of his camera. They were hooked and went on to film all sorts of fish like sunfish, crappies, rainbow trout, and northern pike. I really like showing people fish in the, in the freshwater lakes. All the saltwater stuff that I shoot is really great and it's pretty and everything, but anybody can see that. 
Like Curtis, Todd prefers seeing natural over planted items in the water. I'd rather go see these other items, the mining artifacts, the fish, good visibility, that's more important to me. It's a great stress reliever, because when you go down, you don't have your phone, you don't have anybody talking to you. The only sound that you hear is your, your breathing. It's really nice, quiet, peaceful. But I have reduced the amount of uh, beef I eat because I'm getting the nutrition I need from crickets and worms and, and I'm helping the world out. Edging the weed suppression mat, the instruction booklet, and of course, the native plants. Barbecued crickets. Well, oh, yeah, that's delicious. Oh yeah. Good crunch. Mm-hmm. Good flavor, good crunch. Then it's lunchtime, so I'm kind of hungry anyway. <laughs> I'm probably gonna eat this whole bowl. That's really good. <laughs> oh. Mm. I spent a lot of time in the wild, so there's no doubt I've probably swallowed a few bugs, but never intentionally, until I met Chad and Claire Simons at Three Cricketeers in St. Louis Park. They produce about a thousand pounds of crickets per month with very little environmental impact. So why would somebody choose to raise insects for a living? Chad had studied alternative proteins as an environmental law student. And when his son came home with a cricket cookie on Earth Day, he was inspired. Chad thought it would be fun to raise crickets in their basement. But when he brought the idea to his wife, Claire, the first word she uttered was... Gross. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was really scared. I think the first time we were cooking them, we did have a few drinks in between, <laughs> and it was definitely an experience, and we've definitely improved. Yeah. yeah. Claire is a nurse and passionate about nutrition. So when she learned that only two tablespoons of cricket powder have 15 grams of protein and are an excellent source of B12, iron, calcium, and prebiotic fiber, she hopped on the cricket train. Started sneaking it into everything we ate, and the boys loved it, and they jumped on board too. So that's three cricketeers for our three boys. I love my hamburgers, you know, and I love my steak. Um, but I have reduced the amount of uh, beef I eat because I'm getting the nutrition I need from crickets and worms and, and I'm helping the world out, you know, environmentally. First operation was a setup underneath the counter in our laundry room in the basement. We had a couple 20 gallon totes filled with wet peat moss at the bottom, just a bottom layer. We built a terrarium down there where they could stay warm and they hatched the first time. So we thought, oh, we can do this. So we moved yep. up to a 700 foot square foot warehouse after that. It was definitely fun to be able to grow them and it was not that difficult. Three Cricketeers' current facility is 3,500 square feet and holds five million crickets. Here we have adolescent crickets. You can see them growing in there. These are about uh, two weeks old. That's a ground up organic chicken feed in there. And then uh, we use these water bottles that people can use with chickens. We just put paper towel in there so they don't drown in the water when they crawl in there to get a drink. It just looks like they're hanging at the beach yeah. in there. Yeah. They're hanging out in their condo. Right. So yeah, you can see below here we have a chipboard bottle partitions, and then that gives them a lot of surface area to crawl on, and then they uh, they like to be uh, covered by something because they like to hide. They like to hide, be in the dark, and together. So they don't try to get out of here, and they only jump six inches. So they really, they're happy. So right now I'm gonna take this off, and there's gonna be an egg pan underneath where they lay their eggs. Females can lay up to 100 eggs a day. Right here we have the incubator. So once we take these pie pans filled with uh, wet peat moss that have eggs in them, we put them in here. So what you see here are the little, what we call pinheads, the, the hatchlings, they just hatch. After the pinheads are about three days old, egg trays go into four by eight chipboard partitions and crickets are harvested after a month. 
First, they stop feedings to clear the insect's digestive tracts. All that poop is sold for plant food. Then, crickets are placed in a 50 degree Fahrenheit environment where they go into hibernation before they're frozen and transferred to a commercial kitchen. After they come in frozen, we boil them and then we dehydrate them in the dehydrator. We then mill them into a very fine powder, so it's just like flour, and we can make cookies with them. We make flavored roasted crickets with the whole cricket and other products that we're coming out with soon. I tried a molasses cookie that has five grams of protein and not a hint of cricket crunch or taste. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Mm. I'll take every single one. Three Cricketeers sell some of their powder to food businesses. Chef Gustavo Romero owns Nixta Tortilleria in Minneapolis. He makes four to 5,000 tortillas a week using heirloom corn from Oaxaca and central Mexico where he grew up. Chef Gustavo and his staff prepare 180 to 200 takeout meals a week and add cricket powder to tortillas when customers ask for it. So we first started with the crickets. Uh, these ones, they come to me frozen from uh, from the, uh, the cricket ears, and all we do is we dry them, throw them in the oven dehydrator uh, until they're completely dry. Then we just put it in a, uh, in a food processor or in a grinder in the, until we pulverize it. Um, after that is pulverized, uh, we add uh, about a tablespoon of uh, cricket powder for a pound of dough and then that's what the dough will look like. Um, it's kind of a little bit off color because the, um, the corn was white. Uh, and then after that, then we just press it because we have to press it by hand so we don't contaminate uh, our machine. And then you end it up with a tortilla. It's a lot of people that are still afraid of, of trying crickets. Uh, I grew up eating them. It's just something that we eat as a, as a snack back home. And the more that I learn how good it is for you, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for, for people that like something else than meat to, as a source of protein. I think people are gonna be super excited about it. Three Cricketeers also sells their products at farmer's markets, specialty stores, and online to customers like Kaya Braj, who's been eating insects since she was a student at the University of Minnesota, Duluth. That my professor actually brought in cricket cookies um, and I didn't even know that it was possible to eat insects before that. And I was a little bit hesitant the first time that I ate them. Um, and once I tried them and, and started learning more about how they're raised and, and all of the um, sustainability aspects of eating insects, I thought, why haven't I heard of this before? She reached out to insect eaters called entomophagists to learn how to forage for insects and prepare them. I have tried crickets was the first one, and then I tried mealworms. I love mealworms. Kaya went on to teach in Thailand where insect farming is a huge industry. I would go to the 7-Eleven and just like there's bags of chips by the checkout register, there were bags of crickets. They had barbecue flavor, sea salt flavor. Kaya now lives in St. Paul and forages for grasshoppers in her country friend's short grass fields that haven't been sprayed with pesticides. They are very tricky to catch sometimes. So sometimes the caloric output <laughs> when you're trying to catch them can be more than you're eating. Um, but I do it more for like the adventure of it. You really have to get up early to get out there because that's when they're a little bit slower. They're a little bit easier to catch. I don't use a net. I just use my hands. <laughs> they're just easier to catch that way. My favorite way to eat those is to first boil them. Um, to kind of cook them all the way through, and they turn this bright red like a lobster. It's so cool to watch. Sometimes I'll roast them after that and put them in the oven. Um, sometimes I'll coat them in seasoning, and usually the way I like to eat them is tacos. They're, they make a really mean taco. While I do love foraging for insects, it is a lot of work. <laughs> and so the solution that I came up with um, was this beautiful, um, contraption right here. This is from a company called Live-In Farms. So this is a growing system for mealworms. There are multiple bins, as you can see here, for different stages in the mealworm life cycle. Um, so a lot of people have, you know, if they can, they have backyard chickens and things like that. Well, I don't even have to have a backyard for this. I can just put this on my counter and I can grow my own protein. Kaya is a middle school science teacher 
and introduces students to insects at their level of getting past the ick factor. Mealworm banana bread is a starter food. The next level up is chocolate covered grasshoppers. Recently, over the course of the past three years, I mean, we've seen a huge upturn in interest and openness to the, uh, the eating insects in general. And I, you know, a lot of people are seeking us out now. So it's really, really changed over the last three years. Over 80% of the world's cultures use insects in some way in their cuisine. They have known the secret and us in the Western world, we're kind of just catching up to that. I built a five by five garden. Just in that space, I noticed so much biodiversity in the insects and the plants and everything that it really struck me that anybody just even doing a small five by five space really makes a really big difference. I'm always telling my friends about how important it is to plant native plants and they obviously support me. They think I'm a cool guy but I feel like we hadn't made it simple enough for normal people in small landscapes and normal backyards, restricted budgets, that sort of thing, to do such a thing. It's hard to know where to start, it's hard to know what plants to choose, so we figured with our expertise, let's try to put together a package that's everything anybody could need to really make a big difference in a small landscape with a tight budget. One of the cool things about the My Pocket Prairie kit different than just a, a regular native plant kit that we've been selling for years is that it comes with instructions for the assembly but also a, a pre-designed layout so we know that this layout will work well we know it looks nice it supports pollinators um, and it really helps uh, any backyard gardener uh, answer how do i do this or am i going to screw this up it kind of takes all the guesswork out of it i grow something like 200 different species so it was it took all of us to finally vet these nine that we wanted to narrow it down to. It was certainly an adventure coming up with the materials for how we actually build the insulation kit, sourcing them through all sorts of different uh, other small businesses within the area. And ultimately, I think we're really happy with what we came up with. The cost of the 5x5 five five My Pocket Prairie bundle is $150 that comes with the edging, the weed suppression mat, the instruction booklet, and of course, the native plants. What you have in here is a full garden kit. So everything needed to build a five by five little pocket prairie. We're gonna save the plants for last. This is made from a aspen byproduct and it's uh, biodegradable. This is what's going to kind of choke out your turf grass, compete with invasive weeds and nurture your plants over about a three year period until it decomposes. And here are our native perennials. We have 27 plants total in nine different species, all native uh, to Minnesota, selected for their various bloom times and colors and their uh, great ecological value. We're gonna lay down our mat in the desired location. And we'll temporarily staple it in. With the mat in place, we can then start to cut out the edge. Ultimately, we're going to flip all the sod and till our garden up in this location. So the first plant in our series is the slender pensamen, and this is gonna be our first flower to bloom each year, May through June. 
And as you can see, it's right on time. Next is going to be the butterfly milkweeds. And you'll see I've got three planted in a row here. Uh, monarchs tend to prefer to lay their eggs in clusters of milkweeds. Three is our purple prairie clover. Four is a uh, rattlesnake master. It's definitely a favorite amongst many. Five, we have our echinacea. In this case, specifically narrow leaf cornflower. Number six in your planting sequence is the metal blazing star. Number seven is a uh, gray goldenrod. It's a short statured yellow flower. It's uh, gonna be an autumn bloom along with the sky blue aster, which will be your second autumn bloom. So these little blue stem grasses, which is number nine in the series, uh, it's gonna add structure and support to the forbs. So my pocket prairie bundle provides a lot of benefits with those deep-rooted native plant species. They're filtering groundwater, preventing erosion, hosting native pollinators and songbirds alike. I think about the insects a lot and I think about the ecosystem a lot and that's why I figured we could do our part to make it easy for everybody else to uh, help make a difference. It's almost like a, it makes you feel less alone. There's all sorts of critters coexisting besides us and it's something I think we should feel good about. Funding for this program was provided by Safe Basements of Minnesota, your basement waterproofing and foundation repair specialist since 1990. Peace of mind is a safe basement. Live wide open. The more people know about West Central Minnesota, the more reasons they have to live here. More at livewideopen.com. Western Minnesota Prairie Waters, where peace, relaxation, and opportunities await and the members of Pioneer PBS. Well, we're in Brainerd today at the Minnesota School of Diving, and uh, we're gonna go diving at Cuyuna. They got a suit specially made for me right here.